from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Thanks for joining us. If you're not already, please make sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and elsewhere and be kind enough to leave us a nice review. This week, we're taking a deeper look at the Republican Party. Donald Trump is back in the news. Was he ever really out of it? With the declaration of his candidacy for the Republican presidential nomination in 2024. This as, following the disappointing results of the midterm elections, the GOP is poised to take control of the House of Representatives by just about the narrowest of margins. And of course, it failed to take control of the Senate. So is the future of the Republican Party really a return to the recent past? Or should it be looking forward to fresh leadership and direction? What kind of conservatism should the party now embrace? And what should Republicans do with their tenuous control of one half of the Congress? With me to discuss all this is Republican Congressman Kevin Brady of Texas. Brady's been a member of the House of Representatives for a quarter of a century. He's currently the ranking member on the House Ways and Means Committee, having been chairman of the committee before that. He's been a strong advocate for tax reform and reducing the tax burden on families. He's also a keen supporter of expanding free trade, though he was an early politician warning about the economic and strategic threat from China. He backed Donald Trump and his efforts to challenge the results of the 2020 election. But Brady recently announced his retirement and is stepping down from Congress when the new House assembles in the new year. And Congressman Kevin Brady joins me now. Congressman, thanks very much for being here. No, Jerry, thanks for having me. So I thought I'd take the opportunity with you, and thanks for doing this as you come to the end of your congressional career, to consider where we are, whether the Republican Party is, what the challenges are ahead for the Republican Party, and indeed, obviously, for the nation as a whole. And I want to get into that. And I know you've got some strong thoughts about the right approach now for the country in the next few years. But inevitably, <laughs> I want to start off with talking about the news and talking about what's gone on. Obviously, we had the midterm elections last week, which turned out to be very disappointing for Republicans, given where the expectations were. It does look like it managed to take control of the House, perhaps just just by the thinnest of margins, but failed in the Senate. So I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, if I may come to you, obviously, we're recording this on Wednesday. On Tuesday night, Donald Trump declared another bid for the third consecutive bid for the presidency, despite the fact that many of his candidates in last week's elections didn't do so well. I'm wondering what you make of Trump. You supported him in the past. You were supportive of him when he was president. Now I wonder what you make as he now embarks on a third campaign. Do you think this is the right way for the Republican Party to go? You know, we're focused right now on getting the majority in the House, obviously. I think we are there, but we haven't seen those final numbers as well. Setting up our leaders, and I'm confident Kevin McCarthy will be the Speaker of the House, and then setting up our committee and other leaders. So that's really been my focus here. I do think it was a disappointing night. It is a puzzling night as well, in the sense that Republicans in the House picked up major seats in states very diverse from each other, from New York to Florida to California and Oregon and Nevada as well. And so I think for us, doing a deep dive postmortem to find out what were the factors that changed those independent voters at the end of that campaign. I believe we uh, recruited probably the strongest set of candidates in House Republican seats. We were fighting, obviously, in strong Biden districts, but still we had hoped to do better. So related to President Trump, I think I didn't get a chance to see the announcement this week. I think he will be a formidable candidate in the primaries, but I think there will be other formidable candidates in that primary because Republicans will be looking to that candidate who gives them the best chance of winning in the general election against whoever that Democrat opponent as well. There's no question strong support or many of President Trump's policies, certainly, but I think that's going to be weighed against the electability in the general election. Do you think that, though, that, you, as you say, we've got to digest those results from last week, it does look pretty striking that so many of those candidates that President Trump backed in the Senate and to some extent in the House too, and his continuing insistence on relitigating the 2020 election and insisting that it was stolen does seem, as far as we can tell, from the results themselves and from the polling and everything else, that it was a factor. Do you agree that Donald Trump was a drag on the ticket? You know, to what degree, I don't know. And I don't want to be premature until we've really dug deeper. I think one key point here is that Americans want to move forward. They are looking to the future. And clearly, with affordability being so difficult on families, crime and security major issues, I think they're certainly looking for Republican candidates, especially who are making this case. They are looking to how do you make our lives better in the future versus looking back to that last election. I think that is the very strong takeaway from November. What did you make of Ron DeSantis' performance in Florida? And what does that say about his future? You know, really remarkable, entering a state that has been a squeaker 
for either party, certainly for Republicans, Senate and governor and the president into a 20 point win, as well as carrying four new congressional Republicans forward as well. That was a tour de force in Florida. Certainly he has very strong conservative pro-growth, pro-security credentials that people in Florida certainly recognize. And for us to win the presidential election two years from now, we need candidates, I think, who uh, are optimistic, who can work across the aisle, who aren't afraid to punch back on unfair attacks. And those priorities are serving your constituents in Florida. Clearly, a lot of Floridians of all parties see Governor DeSantis as the right approach. You talked about the next Congress and the leadership. And as you say, we don't know the final results yet, but it does look pretty well certain now that Republicans will have a majority, maybe a handful of seats, perhaps at the most. And you just said to me that you're strongly confident that uh, Kevin McCarthy will be the speaker. And there was a vote, obviously, on Tuesday, which indicated he has strong support within the court, within the current caucus. Obviously, we'll have a new Congress who's got to elect a speaker. And of course, he does have to get a majority of the House, which, given that some members of the caucus do seem to be quite strongly opposed to him, could be complicated. But you're confident that he's the one member who can command a majority of the House to become Speaker, are you? Yes, I am. And as you know, this wasn't always the case. But I think in the, in the recent decade, you've seen both in Speaker Pelosi as well as Speaker Boehner and Speaker Ryan. Initially, in these first votes, there are dissenters from the nominee. And then before actual election day, in this case, January 3rd, those issues are worked out. And in this case, I look at those who voted against Kevin McCarthy yesterday, and really, I think many of them wanted a conversation about the process of the House, the rules of how we operate, representation on key committees, all, I think, legitimate points of discussion. And I'm confident Leader McCarthy and what I expect to be Speaker McCarthy can find common ground with those members. Is that what's going on here? Sort of, if I may say so, a sort of bit of horse trading that those members who are saying, when you voted against him this week and they were saying they don't necessarily support him for speaker, are they trying to extract concessions on, as you say, things like membership of House committees? And is there a kind of a deal in the works there? Do you think is that what's happening? You know, I think here the case is listening to the concerns about how Congress operates. And I think there's some legitimate approaches here, solutions that are being discussed, I think, by the way, benefits everyone in both parties in the House. And this is really the only chance every two years to fine tune how we operate. And in truth, I think given how Speaker Pelosi has really dismantled some of the institutions in the House and really created one party rule so strict that it really impedes democracy and the free debate in the House, it is time to sort of reimagine our operations here. And I think those will dominate the discussions. Assuming it is Speaker McCarthy, and assuming, again, we have a Republican leadership beginning in early January in the House, we're going to have, again, a Democrat-controlled Senate. So what should be the priorities for the House? I mean, getting legislation passed is obviously going to require cooperation with the Democrat-controlled Senate. So are there opportunities for bipartisan agreement there? Or should the House focus on promoting, from a kind of almost from a sort of public relations point of view, a strong conservative agenda, irrespective of whether legislation is going to get passed. Yeah, so I think clearly whether the margin is tight or not, the majority in the House has some real impacts for America. One, it is an automatic checks and balance against the one-party rule in Washington, D.C. So it stops the more, I believe, radical agenda from President Biden and Democrats in Congress. That's first and foremost. Secondly, it provides the power of the purse is now a check and balance. So the House can use that leverage on spending each year in the budget to challenge executive overreach or executive actions and regulations that are not approved by Congress or go outside their legal bounds. And thirdly, though, to your point, we have, in my view, a year, 2023, before the Iowa caucuses, presidential caucuses, to leave that impression and drive those issues that American families and workers can embrace. And so you'll see House Republicans advancing the commitment to America, which is really based on economy that's strong, nation that's safe, a future that's built on freedom, and then a government that's accountable. And in that, certainly in the area that I work in ways and means, and the economy is strong, is going to be a focus on affordability, you know, and lowering the cost of living, you know, making American energy more independent 
and reducing gas prices, but you'll see less government spending taxes and regulation that fuel inflation, more American-made energy, more workers reconnected to their work, and more innovation that reduces the pressure on inflation. Obviously, it's going to be a big challenge because taming President Biden's inflation and the harm that the Federal Reserve must create, again, to tame President Biden's inflation, these are going to be very damaging. We don't think Congress should just stand by. We should do what we can to help create jobs, protect jobs, make life more affordable. We've got to take a quick break now, but when we come back, we'll have more with Congressman Kevin Brady on the future of the Republican Party. Stay with us. I'm back with Congressman Kevin Brady, retiring member of Congress. And we're talking about the future of the Republican Party and the kind of conservatism the Republican Party should be embracing. You've been, the, as I said at the start, the leading Republican on House Ways and Means now for a long time. And as you hand over that role and in the context of this small majority in the House and the Democratic majority in the Senate, what can be done on taxes on either you know, reducing the tax burden overall, which you've been very enthusiastic supporter of and have managed to do on a number of occasions. But again, with that control of the Senate out of reach, what, for example, on taxes in terms of the bigger fiscal picture that the United States face, what would you like to see done? Well, I think first, Republicans have to try at least to repair the damage that President Biden has done to the economy. Certainly, increasing taxes on made in America manufacturing, on savers and retirees, and on small businesses, all of which was in the so called Inflation Reduction Act, couldn't have come at a worse time. We're one of the few countries that's raising taxes as we head into a recession. The rest of the world is doing the opposite. And we think there's significant economic damage. We are going, in my view, going to address that. But in other ways, I think looking ahead to 2025, when the family and small business tax cuts expire, certainly uh, locking in those lower rates, those double standard deductions, that new small business tax deduction, all of which drove the economy, drove wages going up twice as fast as inflation and really create a giant sucking sound back into the United States of jobs and patents and technology. There's a certainty that having lower taxes that I think can be helpful right now as we battle the economic pain of the president's recession. As you look at the Senate, you know, and again, we don't yet know the final outcome in the Senate. It could be 50-50, it could be 51-49 Democrat, but there have been throughout the last two years, at least one or two Senate Democrats, Manchin and Cinema in particular, who have been, shall we say, more cautious about the president's aggressive agenda than the rest of their colleagues. Do you think there's a chance there to reach across the aisle to do some of these things, particularly on the tax cuts expiring in 25, as you said? Do you think perhaps the House can work again with the Senate Republicans and maybe peel off one or two of those Democrats in order to get some other tax reforms through? Yeah, I certainly hope so. We are going to work in the the few remaining weeks we have in this session to see if we can't continue to extend those three tax cuts and jobs acts provisions that are starting to expire they're they're really important to economic growth to research and development uh, and investment in America they should be uh, bipartisan they're not very costly Jerry at all but they're important to grow we're hopeful we can put together some common ground balanced small package this year if not I think that bipartisan work is going to continue there. I think Democrats, I noticed in this past two years, have aligned many of their programs temporarily to expire at the same time. The tax cuts expire in 2025, I assume. That's to have an environment where maybe there's common ground in a balanced package that can do both. So that's my take on what their timing has been on a number of these provisions that are temporary these past two years. One of the things we saw under President Obama when we had a Democrat in the White House and a Republican control at least one House of Congress was we had these sort of repeated episodes over the debt limit, over spending and repeated standoffs there where you know, we came, I don't know how close we came. You can probably tell us how close we came, but there were some nervous times, I think, in the markets where we did like we might come close to the government not being able to be funded or overshooting the debt limit. Is that something you'd advise your successors to steer clear of? Not just, I mean, from the financial point of view, but also from the political point of view, because it didn't really seem to rebound to the Republicans' favor, did it? It often seemed that the Republicans kind of got the blame for that. Is that kind of brinkmanship something you think they should resist? Short answer is yes. One, I'm very confident our debts will be paid and our government's going to be funded. I am hopeful 
that there will be an adult conversation in those moments about how we address long term really the financial status of America, a certainly longer term, a bipartisan approach that focuses on more economic growth that provides revenues, but some smart guardrails that can really balance government spending versus the economy. That growth and guardrails approach over time, I think, can put us in a much better financial situation. What I do know is there are no Republicans, despite Democrats and President Biden's claims. There are no Republicans who are seeking a dispute on debt limit over Social Security, cutting Social Security and Medicare. The truth is our policy is very clear. We want to strengthen and save, preserve Social Security and Medicare. It will take a bipartisan effort, a very thoughtful one, a very diligent one, uh, to do that together. And so I do believe pre-election that those claims were not only false, it was fear-mongering. And we ought not do that as we're discussing issues like funding the government and paying our debts. Something else that Republicans have talked a lot about in the campaign, and there are some Republicans who are very eager to do this, is investigations. Obviously, having control of those key oversight committees does give the majority the chance to pursue investigations. There's been talks about all kinds of things, whether the president's son, the president's own relations with Ukraine, maybe things like the withdrawal from Afghanistan, some of the other issues that Republicans and conservatives have been agitated about. Do you think with the results of the election as it was, and with the very, very thin majority Republicans had. Is that something that now perhaps should be deprioritized? Well, the short answer is accountability should always be a priority. I can speak best to the Ways and Means Committee and where our focus will be. So our belief is that the American public has been in the dark about how the government operates for the past two years. There's been no accountability to that. And so at least in the Ways and Means Committee, you'll see a focus on things that matter to families and workers such as we just saw the greatest theft of American tax dollars in history, up to $400 billion in unemployment fraud. How did that happen? How do we prevent it? How do we recover those tax dollars? Within the IRS, obviously, we've got millions of Americans who are still waiting for their tax return. They are worried about the privacy of their tax returns, which have been leaked to media organizations. They are concerned about this bank surveillance scheme that the Biden administration is still pushing for. And they want to know, you know, when is this army of IRS agents? How and when are they going to land on them? You'll also see accountability as far as healthcare dollars, a giveaway of American medical technology to China and other countries, the nursing home deaths during COVID. There's never been an answer to why so many Americans lost their parents and grandparents. So Our focus on accountability is going to be on the issues that matter to families and workers. We think that's where the priorities are. One other particular policy issue I just want to touch on, Congressman, is trade. You were very much a supporter of President Trump's renegotiation of NAFTA, USMCA, and the Republican has obviously supported that, and you were a keen advocate of that. But you've also been a strong critic, obviously, of some of the US policies to China over the years, and you supported President Trump's measures in that. I think you supported some of President Biden's toughening of trade relations with China, particularly over the recent semiconductor plan the president has. All that said, what should be the right approach? What, should, again, should be the approach you take? Because obviously, you know, there are benefits from trade. There are significant economic growth benefits from trade, as well as there being costs for certain Americans, and as well as there being national security and other implications. Do you want to see this next Congress maybe try to see whether there are opportunities for new trade agreements, or is that kind of basically just off the agenda now until the next election? Well, I'm convinced there's bipartisan support for trade, and the truth of the matter, and for good reason. Look, it's not enough to buy American. You have to sell American all throughout the world, and what we find is significant barriers for our farmers, our manufacturers, our tech workers, and others. And we know when we compete on a level playing field, we win. We create jobs, real jobs, economic growth here in America. The problem is President Biden is off the trade field at a time when China, Europe, Japan, others are reaching agreements that put their workers in charge or with an advantage. President Biden has called really a halt to all discussions on new free trade agreements. So we are at a time we need to be challenging China's economic aggression. We're on the sidelines at a time when we need a level playing field. We need customers for our products and services. The president has chosen what I would call shallow trade dialogue frameworks, working groups that really don't move the needle. America needs to be leading on trade, and I'm convinced, based on really the historic vote 
on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the strongest vote I've seen on a trade agreement in the 26 years I've been in Congress. I think there is a lot of momentum there. I worry the president has squandered that momentum, but could he be, like President Obama, someone who wasn't interested in trade in those first two years, but understood, grasped the importance of that economically, strategically, national security-wise? I'm hopeful he can grasp that, but I think the conventional wisdom is that he will keep the moratorium in place and not make a change in direction. Finally, Congressman, you've been a leading member of the Republican Party, a leading figure in Congress, you say, for a long time. You've been a staunch economic conservative and social conservative, and you've seen the party develop and grow and adapt and evolve in that time. Beyond the personalities here, because everybody is so focused on Trump and DeSantis and whoever else may be running, we've been seem to have been obsessed with sort of personality politics for the last few years. Do you have a comfortable and strong sense of where you think the Republican Party is heading. Under Trump, it does seem to have abandoned some of those core principles that defined it for so long. You know, kind of, whether it was free trade, for example, strong support of free trade, Trump has been critical about that. Whether it was supporting sort of legal immigration, whether it was in favor of strongly pro-business. There is a very strong populist element to the party now, which is critical of trade. It's very strongly critical of immigration. It's very strongly critical of much of the way American capitalism works. Some of it even wants to be more supportive of government programs like Social Security in Medicare, some of it wants even more regulation. Where do you think the party is heading and where should it be heading? What's the future of, of American conservatism? You know, in many ways, I'm very optimistic about the direction the Republican Party is going. And specifically, we are now the party of the working family in a major way. And we are the party of tremendous growth among Hispanics in America. We see this obviously in Texas, but you see it around the country as well. Those are very important trends for this party. And I think it's here to stay for us. I believe we remain very pro-growth. I think we're very free trade oriented. I think tariffs, obviously the President Trump was very pro-tariff, sought as means to drive foreign countries to the negotiating table. In some cases, I think it ended up in agreements that were important to us, certainly drove China to the negotiating table for the phase one agreement. Overall, tariffs are still taxes. They drive up the cost of goods and services. They distort the economy. So my view is always less is better, zero is the best. And I think that's still the feeling of much of the Republican Party. Certainly economic freedom, including trade, is at the heart of who we are. We're a pro-security a party. We're a pro-family party. Certainly limited government and privacy, very important to us and, and key issues going forward. I do worry, especially the last two years, we've seen, I think, too much embrace of corporate subsidies, the CHIPS Bill, I think, is an example of an unwarranted package of subsidies for the strongest semiconductor industry in the world, frankly. In that case, I think we ignored China's real national security threat, which is they're targeting 10 of America's key manufacturing and technology sectors. We apparently ceded nine of them to China to assist one. And so I do worry that when there is spending going on, I don't want big government, big labor, and big business to, to act the same. You know, I think America struggles when that happens. And so I think there is, within the Republican Party, a new commitment to economic freedom and to security, uh, to individual rights and limited government. They just take a different form a little these days. Congressman Kevin Brady, I know you've still got a lot of work to do in the remaining six or seven weeks before you leave, but thank you very much for all your great work in Congress. Thanks for giving us a great conversation, and, and thank you very much for being here. No, Jerry, it is my pleasure. These are the issues that really matter to me, and I think to the country as well. So thank you for raising them and, and having the conversation. Thanks, Kevin. You bet. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week as we take another deep dive into some of the big issues that are shaping our world. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>